Hello and welcome to the Daily Space for June 11th, 2018. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I'm going to bring you a uh, quick roundup of today's astronomy and space science news. As always, Daily Space is brought to you by CosmoQuest. We are a multi-institutional collaboration led out of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, if you like what you see, please follow so that you can get an alert every time we are going live. Uh, if you want to help, we currently have a data call for people to help us map out Mars and Mercury. So click on over to CosmoQuest.org and you can help us explore our solar system. Now, in today's news, uh, we actually get the chance to start with what may best be described as a pretty picture kind of story. This uh, little nebula is a planetary nebula. These kinds of objects are formed when stars not too different from our sun. Uh, as they die, they puff off their outer atmosphere. And the shape they form as they lose their atmosphere is determined by their environment. Our sun, when it meets its fate like this someday, the gas and dust it gives off is going to get reshaped by how that gas and dust interacts with the planets and asteroids we have in our own solar system. In this particular system, the Stingray Nebula, uh, what we're seeing is a binary star system. So as you look at this, you can see here is the central brighter star that created this nebula that we see. And off over here is the second star. Now, while this big pretty image is one that comes to us from the Hubble Space Telescope, this particular object has been observed in a variety of different wavelengths, including in radio wavelengths. These are the colors of light that your, well, your radio is sensitive to. Uh, radios, uh, they actually just see really long wavelengths of light and transform that into the audio you hear. So you can actually think of your, well, your radio, when you press that record button, you're essentially taking a video just in a completely different wavelength set. Well, in observing this particular system in radio wavelengths, they were able to trace out various kinds of emission in this particular system. And what's kind of amazing is by doing this, they were able to find that the radio and the optical trace one another quite nicely. As you look over here, you see that in the 21 gigahertz radio, we have a cleared out area that is all of maximum radio brightness in towards the center. And then we see that as we look at different wavelengths, we end up with a radio that also traces out along this feature right here. These are the places where the various shock waves uh, from the planetary nebula, by which I mean the gas interacting with the local uh, surrounding material, is being excited to give off emission. Now this particular system they've actually been observing since 2005 uh, for these high resolution pictures and all the way back to 1992 in general as they've observed this system over the years, they've seen it actually change in brightness. This seems to be indicating that some of the ionized radiation, this is atoms that are missing uh, some of their electrons, some of these ionized particles are recombining. They're going through, uh, sorry, um, they're reionizing. So they had previously uh, grabbed onto some of their electrons and now they're losing electrons again. So this is a multifaceted process. Uh, as they're doing that, it changes what we're able to see in the system. Now, uh, in looking at this system, 
it turns out one of the reasons that people don't talk about for why the Hubble Space Telescope was constructed was to figure out systems just like this. This particular nebula looks like nothing but a faint green fuzzy if you look at it through some of the biggest telescopes in the world. It's only when you start using space telescopes or the very large telescope down in Chile that you start to be able to make out these details. And well, the VLT wasn't there when we launched Hubble back in the 90s. With the Hubble Space Telescope, for the first time ever, we were able to resolve what these fuzzy spots in the sky are. This particular one, well, this green is oxygen. It's an oxygen-rich system, again, made of the atmosphere that was puffed off by a dying star. And the structure that we see in looking at it, uh, what we find is these two ends, this is actually outflow from the the nebula so as or from the central star so as this star goes around and around it's collimating the emission in these particular directions so this is a pretty cool system that is actually hot enough to ionize atoms and we're able to see it evolve over time thanks to long-term astronomical observations. So next time someone asks you, why do we need to have telescopes, well, year after year, and why do we keep looking at the same objects? Well, it turns out that if you look year after year, you actually can see our universe evolve. Now, looking at a completely different kind of image, one of the things that we've been struggling with in astronomy is trying to figure out why we keep seeing microwave emission uh, in random seeming places scattered throughout our sky. This is called anomalous microwave emission. Once again, we have a case of we're interacting with light and sometimes we don't even know it. When you use your microwave to heat up food, what you're actually doing is shining light, invisible to our eyeballs, at your food. And it turns out that particular wavelength of light is capable of making the water molecules vibrate. If you try and heat up something that's completely dry, the microwave is going to have no effect whatsoever. Now your soup, it's going to explode and splatter all over the inside of your microwave if you don't cover it up because of all those little water molecules getting vibrated. Well, that same color of light and nearby colors of light that don't quite have the same effect on uh, water, those same colors of light are getting emitted in anomalous locations in various galaxies. Now, it had been thought that this might be caused by uh, poly polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, PHHs, PA. Uh, you may have made some of these when you were in high school chemistry class. These are the various organic compounds that are associated with artif artificial smells. Uh, so that artificial banana scent on scratch and, stiff, scratch and sniff stickers, that's just a polyaromatic hydrocarbon. Now, it turns out that pH PAHs aren't the only things out in space that give off microwave radiation. Nanodiamonds, especially those that have a particularly high load of hydrogen atoms glommed on to the matrix of the diamond, uh, also emit this kind of emission. So astronomers looking at uh, various places where we know there are poly, there are PA. PAHs, uh, places that we know those exist, have been studied looking for this microwave radiation, and uh, we haven't found it. The fact that we don't find this anomalous microwave uh, emission located in the same place that we find the PAHs uh, tells us that the nanodiamonds are probably to blame. Further observations looking at the specific wavelengths of light that are emitted and absorbed by these nanodiamonds has found that, well, these hydrogen-rich nanodiamond spectra match what we find when we look in the same regions of space where we see these anomalous microwave emissions. So through a case of sleuthing for looking for the emission where we know there's PAH and looking for nanodiamonds where we know there's emission. Well, this allowed us to figure out 
which of these two situations we have. And it turns out, well, if you have anomalous microwave emission, you also have nanodiamonds rich in hydrogen. So, uh, and one more beautiful story for the day, we're going to click on over to the Eagle Nebula. Now this particular region of space is a giant molecular cloud which is filled with star formation. And in fact, these central pillars that you see in this image, which are called the pillars of creation, are some place that we look to very, very carefully uh, study exactly how it is solar systems come to be. And one of the hints that we're starting to get, thanks to looking at this system in a way that allows us to detect the orientations of magnetic fields, one of the things that we're finding is these particular pillars seem to be supported by magnetic fields. In this case, we see the north and south ends of, uh, well, imaginary bar magnets lined up with the structure of these particular pillars. It appears that these structures are in part supported through the magnetic field holding the material together. And as these systems form, this will, well, this will affect exactly how uh, everything is aligned. Now, it turns out magnetic fields are one of the harder things to understand. So this is just going to make coming up with a detailed, accurate model of solar system formation that one step harder, but it also means we have one more piece of information. Now, since we're coming off of the American Astronomical Society meeting, which was last week in Denver, and well, since it's a Monday and I think everyone is still recovering from that particular meeting, it's kind of a slow news day today. So this means we have extra time for you to bring me your questions. Once again, this has been The Daily Space. We are a production of CosmoQuest, and we are brought to you through the, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. If you like what you see, please give us a follow so that you can get notified every time we go on air. Here at CosmoQuest X on Twitch, we produce a whole variety of different content. You can tune in every day to see our daily space. Uh, we are here, well not every day, we are here every Monday through Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. London. That's uh, 11, a, no, that's 10 a.m. Pacific. And uh, we will continue to bring you all that is new in astronomy and space science. In addition to the daily space, we also offer Astro 101 lectures on Wednesdays and Fridays directly following daily space. Tuesday evenings, I'm working on a variety of different uh, data visualizations. You can tune in and talk science and talk software. And Sundays, one of our team, data visualization specialists and planetarium show creators, uh, is doing art. So uh, show up and get science in your heads. Uh, we also co-stream various NASA press conferences and launches of spacecraft. So we're basically your place to get science, well, put into your head. So go ahead, ask me any questions you may have. If you can at me in the chat, it'll make it a lot easier for me to find those questions. So looking back through the chat to see if there's anything already in there. Um, I, I like your comment, Paranor, about it's one step harder now with the magnetic fields and it's one leap more interesting. That is entirely true. Um, yes, Henny, uh, that is the Eagle Nebula. Um, I don't know what nano diamonds smell like. Uh, I'm going to say nano diamonds probably smell like a shredded sinus. Uh, oh man, yeah, those acronyms today are so hard to say. Uh, it's definitely a struggle sometimes. Okay. Uh, so Paranor is asking, do you think anything we may learn from the magnetics of the pillars of creation could actually help in fusion tech? 
no, it's it's actually uh, these kinds of magnetic fields aren't that strong. Uh, they just act over very large distances. Um, the kinds of magnetic fields that are useful for fusion are the kind that can find things to the smallest possible space. So here we're looking at things, uh, I'm not actually sure if it's fusion or fission. Um, the um, big ignition system where they're shooting laser beams at particles of glass. Um, they're using that uh, to try and generate energy. Um, these kinds of systems do use magnetic fields to isolate and focus. <sighs> yeah, it's just, it's a complicated system. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so Hanny is asking, what could be the cause of nano diamonds? Uh, they just kind of permeate space in star forming areas. You have all of this dust and, ga and uh, gas that is extraordinarily rich in carbon. And as everything collides together during the formation of a solar system, you end up with a uh, clouds of nano diamonds. If you get yourself a good meteorite, a uh, carbonaceous chondrite or something like that, uh, and you tear it apart in a mass spectrometer, you're going to find that it's littered with nano diamonds. Uh, these aren't the kinds of things that you can exactly wear on a wedding ring unless your wedding ring is made out of a meteorite. Uh, so... Oh, something cool just happened on the stream. Thank you for the follow, Veorita. Um, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think De Vere's is interested in these kinds of diamonds. So do we have any other questions out there? And they don't have to be just about today's stories. No. So, um, Hanny is asking, would it be bad to hit a nano diamond when traveling at a signif significant portion of the speed of light? Well, anything you hit going a significant portion of the speed of light is going to be quite bad. Uh, conservation of momentum uh, is, yeah, it's going to be a bullet no matter what it is. This is one of the problems with traveling extraordinarily fast. Uh, a nano diamond, really, it's it's just like a specially structured large glob of dust. Uh, so the way to think of it is diamonds are a particular molecular form of carbon. We have graphite, we have uh, ash, uh, we have diamond. And diamond is just when the carbon lines up to form a very specific kind of matrix. Uh, so when I say nano diamond, uh, you're not going to see them with your eyeballs. But yeah, just like any other dust, they're going to do you harm. Um, so CosmoQuest, what happens is ask, uh, sorry, Iron Year T50 is asking what happens to planets around a star that turns into, oh, my squirrel got me, that turns into a nebula. Uh, mostly they just get their atmosphere blasted with all sorts of excess particles. Um, but as these excess particles are coming off, the planets migrate further and further away from the central star. So this causes the planets to migrate outwards. Uh, they're going to get colder. What's left behind where the star was is just a white dwarf star, which also is going to cool off over time. Uh, so what we're looking at is, is a situation um, where... Planets migrate out and they get colder because they're further from the star and the star itself cools off over time and so you end up with a bunch of frozen planets. So I see Keeper Mask Map blech. I really can't talk today. Keeper of Maps is asking how big are nano diamonds? Um so it's a bit of, of matter so small that you don't normally see them with like your high school microscope. We're looking at things that are measured in nanometers and the typical period at the end of a sentence is 500,000 500, 
thousand nanometers apart. And my everything is re is ringing here. Sorry about that. Uh, trying to find where on my screen things are ringing. Okay, I think I got everything to stop ringing. Sorry about that. Um, um, so sorry, Larry. I hope that they're a good person. Um, 500,000 nanometers, Larry, 500,000. Um, so yeah, these are going to be um, way smaller than even what you can see with a high school microscope. So little tiny diamonds, little, little tiny diamonds. Do we have any other questions? Um, so Michael is asking, how do you observe the magnetic field in deep space ob objects? Uh, one of the best ways to do it is to look for what's called Zeeman line splitting. This is where you look for how a magnetic field will take the spin up and spin down components of a um, atom's emission line and separate the energies in those two alignments of a molecule. So you'll have a cloud that's made up of a myriad of molecules or atoms. Some of them are spin up. You'll have uh, a myriad or some of the electrons in some of the atoms or molecules will be spin up. Some of the molecules or atoms will have electrons that are spin down. When these spin up and spin down electrons change energy levels, there is the smallest energy difference between these two configurations. In a strong magnetic field, these energy separations can be enhanced. This means that as you crank up the magnetic field, the split in energies between an electron that is spin up in an atom and an electron that is spin down in an atom increases. You see this as a splitting in the line into two different lines when we look at something spectroscopically. The other way that we can spot magnetic fields, although it's not always as detailed an observation, is we look for polarization. Uh, dust can line up, uh, and the way it lines up can be dictated by magnetic fields that are rotating the different particles until they're all, well, aligned in the same direction, uh, just like you might have done with uh, iron filings as a kid. So Hanny is asking, is nano diamonds how space microwave lasers are made? No, masars are, are actually something very different that are often uh, associated with water molecules. Um, we actually, there's masers in Jupiter. Masers have been observed with Jupiter, which is kind of cool. Um, so Hanny is asking, uh, could that be used to find magnetic field of exoplanets? Do you mean the Zeeman line splitting? Yes, theoretically it could. And we did a story um, last week, I think on Thursday, about uh, a graduate student that's working to develop uh, radio instrumentation to do exactly this. Michael is asking, how do you determine the direction of the magnetic field? Uh, so if you have a polarizer, as you rotate the polarizer, you'll see the light go from bright to dark. And uh, by studying how the rotation of the polarizer uh, affects how bright or dark you see the image, this tells you how the magnetic field is lined up. Uh, so it can be just as simple as looking at the polarization direction of the light that we're seeing. Uh, do we have any other questions out there? Oh, lag in the stream is one of those things that kind of drives me crazy. Um, Yes, yes, there is never enough coffee. I totally agree with that. And this is where I reach for my coffee while I wait for questions. So I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Uh, tomorrow uh, I will be back with a double header. I will be back at 1 p.m. Eastern. Thank you for the bits. Bits get turned into how we support our team and by 
uh, cameras and anything else that we might need to support our show. Oh, uh, Peter's saying, my brother was wondering about the moon and how the days have got longer. So I, our Earth is asymmetric, especially when uh, tides get raised up by the gravitational pull of the moon. Over time, uh, forces acting on these asymmetries to constantly torque our planet so that its uh, most massive parts are pointed to the moon. And I'm going to simulate this with two turtles because I have turtles on my desk. So here we have the Earth. It is much more massive. Here we have the moon, much smaller. Now the moon has already locked so that as the Earth rotates over and over again, and it turns out I'm just not that coordinated, um, the turtle the moon as it goes around always keeps its exact same face always pointed at the earth so our asymmetric moon has been torqued by earth's gravity until its uh, most massive bit is pointed towards the earth the earth itself is over time slowing down because the gravitational goal is for these two worlds to end up locked together in how they face one another. Now the earth is much more massive, the moon exerts a much uh, less effective pull on the earth you might say. The force is the same on both these objects. Gravity is symmetric but that force acting on the earth can exert less of an effect. Now as, as this happens, conservation of momentum is causing the moon to migrate outwards. As the moon migrates outwards, uh, we're slowly losing solar eclipses. And this has been happening for a long time. Once upon a time far in the past, our Earth rotated about every 18 hours. We've known that for a long time from mathematical models. And now we're also starting to dive in and I uh, get really good results from the geo geophysical record by combining models, the geophysical record, observations of the moon slowly moving away. We can work backwards to see the period used to be 18 hours. It's slowing down. It's continuing to slow down. And um, in the fullness of time, if our moon earth system uh, is able to gravitationally stay bound together, we will end up eventually facing one another. Now, about when that happens, uh, it, we don't know if our sun uh, will still be interesting. It'll still be there. It'll just be a white dwarf star in the process of cooling off, most likely. But gravity doesn't care if the sun is still giving off light. Gravity cares if its mass is still there. So someday, far in the future, uh, we're looking at days longer than our current month, and that's kind of awesome. Uh, let me see if there were any other questions in there. Um, so, so Paranor, we are going to have Nancy on Learning Space. Um, let me think on Susie. I'm not quite sure um, exactly what I'd ask Susie because I think it would turn into a confessions of how she herds me and Fraser as disobedient children who don't always remember to upload their audio. Um, other questions? Um, so Hanny is asking, does the previous closeness of the moon affect life origination theories? Some of the theories do actually uh, require the tides to be part of how life may have started, but we have a myriad of different theories and not a myriad of data to test them. So while well, yes, some of the theories do require a moon some of them don't and we don't have data to differentiate between whether or not the moon is actually necessary um yes larry you did miss me with morgan on learning space but the video is there for you to go watch uh, i think we're gonna have nancy actually this thursday directly after the daily space um we have another viewer Welcome, other viewer. Um, uh, 
<laughs> PETA, yes, yes. Um, I, as an adult, run out of time to get paperwork done too. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, who is new. Please consider giving us a follow so that we can um, make sure you're aware of everything we're up to. Um, looking to see. I'm not seeing any more questions in, so I think I'm going to wrap up this episode for today. But like I said, we will be back tomorrow. So once again, I'm Dr. Pamela Gay, and this has been The Daily Space. We are a product of CosmoQuest, and uh, we need you to uh, help us accomplish some science. If you've got a few spare moments, please click on over to CosmoQuest.org and let our software teach you how to map out Mars and Mercury. Uh, Every little click really helps. Uh, if you like what you see, please give us a follow. If you want to sustain our efforts, every subscription and every bit really helps. This is a production of multiple institutions. Thank you so much for the bits. Um, Astro Wise. You're always going to be Astro Wise to me. Um, so, uh, we are a production of multiple institutions. Uh, you will see Matt Richardson on the channel from Planetary Science Institute. You will see Annie from Youngstown State University. And we are all coordinated through the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. So thank you all for turning up. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your bits, Keeper of Maps and AstroWise. Thank you for the follow, the Yorito. Uh, and I'm sorry if I totally mangled the pronunciation of that. And I will see you back here tomorrow. Wherever in the world you may be, have a wonderful morning, evening, or afternoon. And remember, go outside and sometimes look up. <laughs>